Mm-hmm. How is Stanford and how is the, the Silicon Valley? It's uh, dark right now. It's night time. Really? It's 10 p.m. Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm nearby. Okay. It's just a bike path that way. Okay. Okay. I'm mean, like I'm a lot here. of people were ask, asking me like, you know, James, he's an EIR, an entrepreneur in residence. And we want to know how to be one. Probably in, in Q and A, we'll, we'll take that. But before that, let me quickly introduce. We 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 are on time here. Uh, good morning, good evening, greetings, everyone. Welcome to Adoro's Masterclass. Uh, I'm Saurabh Gupta. I'm the co-founder and CEO. And with me is none other than James. He is a brilliant sustainability leader uh, and also founder of uh, uh, Region Villages and uh, also director of the care at Stanford University School of Medicine. I would definitely read out uh, all the accolades that he has so that we know our speaker today well. But before that, we'll quickly tell you what uh, Adoro's Masterclass is all about. Adoro's Masterclass, is, this is our first session. Uh, we'll be having some amazing uh, speakers and domain leaders and solvers like James who would be joining these masterclasses. Uh, and these are basically essentially talks, inspiring talks from people like him, and also a direct AMA. Ask them anything that you want, uh, and that will enlighten us. That will inspire us to achieve and to excel in our own fields. Uh, I will quickly take you through what James has achieved, and then the floor will be all yours, James. So let me quickly introduce you here. This is a long one, but, but trust me, he, he, he owes all of it. So James Elridge is an entrepreneur in residence at the Center of Compassion and Altruism Research, the care and education at Stanford University School of Medicine. Uh, he, James is also appointed faculty at Singularity University, senior fellow at NASA Ames Research Center, and a White House OSTV appointee to a joint task force on regenerative infrastructure. Mr. Elrich is also the founder of Region Villages Holdings, a Stanford University spin-off in the EU as a Dutch impact for profit company using machine learning software to address the UN 17 sustainable development goals. And this is something really interesting to me as well. I would really like to understand during this talk today as well, specifically to provide solutions for affordable housing, climate change, adaptability, and regenerative resiliency. So we are actually talking about the future, which is more sustainable. And that's what this, this talk is all about today. Mr. Elrich founded Region Villages in 2016 with its patent pending Village OS operating system software to design and operate biogenerative and resilient self reliant neighborhood infrastructure and retrofits, integrating clean water, renewable energy, microgrids, high yield organic food, and circular nutritional flows at the neighborhood scale to promote healthy long term outcomes for residents and flourishing communities. James is also a serial entrepreneur in Silicon Valley for over 25 years, he successfully founded and managed technology and media companies with successful exits. For nearly a decade, James, exec- uh, Mr. Elrich, executive produced an award-winning national public broadcasting series based on his case study research of organic and biodynamic family farms that at its apex reached over 35 million homes each week. And is also the co-author of a best-selling companion book on Hashit Organic Living, PhD 2007. James holds a Bachelor of Science from New York University and a Master's Studies in Mechanical Engineering from Stanford. He has won several awards for sustainable design and is a researcher and global lecturer on the topic of regenerative neighborhood development. He has co-authored two EU and UN Sustainable Development Goal Platform briefs with Professor Larry and Chris Ford from the Center for Design Research at Stanford University. So a lot of things. Uh, we are really excited, uh, James, to have you here. The floor is all yours. Please feel free to share your screen and enlighten us. Thank you so much, please. Sure, it's such an honor and pleasure to be here. See, there's a nice group of people already who've, who've hopped on and are here. So I'm gonna share my screen, uh, but I need permission from the host to do that. And I'll try that again. Please and there it goes. That looks encouraging. Um, Okay. So uh, a lot to unpack there with that, with that profile, huh? Uh, A lot of years of experience, a lot of time spent uh, traveling around the world and trying to, to enjoy very delicious food and 
and farm to table communities and experiences. And that was really in many ways, the inspiration for, for Regen Villages and where I come from. Um, so to sort of start the story, I'm originally from New York and I was born and raised. So I really understand the, the urban environment quite well and, and the vibrance and the draw, if you will, to urban areas. At the same time, I was always amazed how anything really ever worked, um, especially when there was some kind of anomaly, you know, whether it was a climate anomaly or some other kind of disruption that um, neighborhood infrastructure especially was prone to, to fault uh, because of district scale issues. And so that, that domino effect whether it's a grid failure or it's a water flow failure or disruptions to whatever it may be that the people feel like they're, they're, they're missing out on something, something's not going right. So I, I, I was kind of tuned to that, if you will, growing up in New York and made my way out to Northern California in the early 1990s uh, to, to start a video game software company with some friends who were working with with George Lucas and Industrial Light and Magic. And we were doing some really interesting tools and technologies at the forefront of, of um, digital special effects for motion pictures. And at the same time doing cartridge game software development and then CD-ROM tools and CD-ROM development. And, and it was a lovely experience, a wonderful time. And I was actually living north of Silicon Valley. I was north of the Golden Gate Bridge in this beautiful community called Marin County, which um, is, is a, a very earthen kind of place and a lot of interesting things happening there that I was learning about and discovering, especially learning and meeting people who were uh, essentially stewarding small plot family farms and learning about organic biodynamic farming and permaculture. So the work of Rudolf Steiner and Buckminster Fuller and Bill Mollison, you know, these amazing leaders of, of thought, you know, on these topics. And, um, and I started to really understand and learn about where food is coming from and where it's going. And as I was tracking, you know, the, the, um, the food and doing, starting to do this case study research, which, which, which kicked off, you know, uh, probably about 15, 16 years worth of case study research. I had, you know, come to a point where I um, started to really feel like this was a passion for me, that I really wanted to pursue this idea of, of um, communities that were built and based on these farm to table principles. Now, what's interesting about this case study research was going from the farm you know, to the table, literally going from the farm into the community, starting to learn about these lovely eco villages and intentional communities around the world. And, and uh, you know, back then, especially, a lot of these technologies were really nascent, you know, passive home construction, right? A house that can generate more power than a family needs. The idea of um, renewable energy, these were early PV panels, you know, they didn't have, you know, microgrids back then and, and, and really good storage solutions, mostly, you know, 12 volt batteries, I, I would say. But they were nonetheless, they were cobbling together, I call it Amish tech, these, these kinds of solutions. And it was really interesting because what I was learning and I was gaining from that experience was these were communities that were resilient in case of, you know, fill in the blank, a district problem. And, and that was something that, that became more and more apparent to me and, and appealing. Um, and furthermore, I started to learn about this, this, this word regenerative, uh, you know, because the word sustainable was something that, that folks, especially in Northern California had been talking about for many years. And that word had been sort of absconded by industry and everything else to greenwash. But the word regenerative actually is much more attuned with where we need to go uh, as a species on this planet. To, to be able to do the things we really need to do. And what regenerative really means is to take the energy, which is typically in, in a system, you'd have energy that, which is, which is sort of, um, you know, the, the way to look at it is entropy, right? It sort of like dissipates. 
over a period of time. And, and we'd rather say, okay, the concept of regenerative is more like syntropy because what it does is that every opportunity you have to recirculate and reuse and, and enable one output into another input that all of a sudden you start to get to this place where you get uh, improvement at, from what was there before. So whether it's restoring ecosystems or, or building something new, it's, it's a, or retrofitting, it's something quite interesting and, and intriguing. So fast forward, I came to Stanford University in uh, 2012, which uh, I was really excited to be joining this, this cohort as a coach and lecturer, uh, what's called the Solar Decathlon, which is uh, a typically a 20 university annual competition. They have about 18 months in a design cycle, but they only have two weeks to build in a designated location around the world, the, uh, these passive kit homes. So they're flat pack. Um, the homes have to be completely functional. And, um, and I entered this, this, this cohort and I, and I essentially went to the professors and I said, look, it, it occurs to me that a smart house inside of a dumb neighborhood doesn't make much sense. And, and I was really fortunate and very blessed that the professors at the time in this group essentially accepted this idea that I was going for. And we were able to, to, to initiate a, um, a research initiative, which I, which I kicked off um, at Stanford. I self-funded some of the research and then both on campus and off campus. But we wanted to go deeper than, than just uh, the infrastructure of the housing and even the, some of the sort of above ground infrastructure that supports it. So we were looking at some software solutions because I'm a software guy, right? What could we do to imagine creating a relationship to nature and to the natural world using software, using machine learning? And, and there was some lovely research out of the University of British Columbia from a doctor, Susan Simard, who had discovered this, what she lovingly termed the wood wide web, which is this actually this electrochemical signaling under the forest floor, um, which, is, which is taking place because of this inoculation of these, of these my, mycorrhizal hyphae threads, right? Which are called mycelial networks. And these are fungal networks, right? But, but her research essentially discovered that this is a broker. It's sort of nature's first uh, ledger cryptocurrency in a way, because the, the network itself is capable of understanding the have need relationship of all these different diverse uh, plants and trees and cultivars and bushes and et cetera under the forest floor. And it's a, an incredible network that's also self-healing, that is, that is immersive, uh, but I think, one of the most important things to take away from this network is the fact that it is, it doesn't possess a central brain. It has intelligence at the point of sensing. And yet it is a, these are single, very large organisms that can span, you know, uh, dozens of kilometers, right? Uh, but they're able to share that information across the wide network. So this to me was, I guess, a, a very interesting, important inspiration point for where we were going with, with designing a software stack. Uh, and, and some other examples of the, the use of, of slime mold in terms of urban planning. And you know, previous to machine learning and artificial intelligence, the, the fungal inoculation using slime mold, this is, these are, this is a map of a Tokyo subway system. And what they do is they put these, these uh, blobs of um, sugar or wheat or other kinds of sugary ingredients on, on the map to essentially indicate uh, um, urban density, you know, populations. And then what they do is they, they, they release the slime mold and the slime mold searches for the most efficient route. And it competes with itself as an organism, which is really interesting not in a bad way, but it's just like racing to figure out the best route to these, these blobs of sugar. 
And another example of that is the US highway system where, where they essentially determined you know, that using these, the slime mold in, in how um, you know, the best, most efficient routes between cities. I think it's important that you, you know, take a quick look at the, the sort of neural network that is, that is established with, with, with the fungal um, spread because it really does resemble our own uh, brains and our own uh, uh, neurology. And, and I think that's really important because we have um, maybe 30% of our DNA originates from, uh, from, from mushrooms, from fungus. Um, it's the oldest living organism on earth. And, and obviously it could be determined that our consciousness and, and our intelligence in many ways and our determination and our way of thinking and, and in uh, whether it's competition or cooperation or merging of the, both of those things is, is, is part of us. So we're part of nature. Uh, and I think it's important to be reminded about that fact uh, and everything that we're talking about here. So that inspiration of, of mycelial networks and, and inoculation and hyphal spread is the kernel of the work that we've been looking at now in, in developing our Village OS software, which is to look at the, the neighborhood scale right? This is like village scale, neighborhood scale, block by block scale, essentially to look at <clears throat> food, water, energy, waste to resource management, um, smart mobility, connectivity to passive homes, <clears throat> and, and other kinds of external services, where literally the output of one system becomes the input of another. And, and, and not only that, but where we can start to expose and explore the previous siloed relationships to these infrastructure pieces. For instance, previously, uh, an energy system didn't really care about or know about a water system or a food system or a waste system. Uh, but we feel that there's a, an opportunity there for these systems to start to understand the why. Why they're connected and what they do for each other in such a way that they can learn and improve. And that really is exciting about this idea of machine learning. So we're getting to this whole topic now of the explosion of AI and ML, machine learning, and, um, and where it's all going. And from our perspective, when we started Regen Villages um, back in 2012 as a research initiative at Stanford, and then founded the Dutch um, impact company in 2016, we were still really way ahead um, in, our, in our thinking of, about machine learning and AI. We knew it was coming and we knew that the, that the systems and services and, and even this ecosystem of algorithms that, that they would be improving and getting better. Uh, at a certain point, we would be able to, to really start to, to make progress with what we were trying to do with what I'm gonna show you here. The other part is that the systems and services previously, you know, starting back in 2012, most of them were, were, were not very smart. They didn't have <clears throat> APIs, application program interfaces. You couldn't really talk to those systems, whether it was an energy system or a water system or whatever it may be. Uh, but since then, a lot of these systems have not only matured and evolved and have controllers and have uh, access to APIs, but, but a good number of them now recognize the, the importance of having open APIs. So you can actually get in there and understand the data and be able to hopefully have some interventions and actuations, et cetera. Anyway, so the Village OS software <clears throat> is comprised of two main components. There is a design side using generative design to imagine uh, virtually beautiful, flourishing residential infrastructure, new build or retrofit on specific pieces of land, right? Where um, you don't need an architect, engineer, consultants, planners, all the different folks who typically get involved. 
in the process that are very expensive and time consuming. So it really reduces the risk profile, um, sort of sim city, sim village, if you will. And the other side of the software is once that community is built and implemented or that retrofit is, is put forth, the village OS continues on as a in situ server. So essentially it's server software to, to run, operate, and, and otherwise um, manage, improve, or mitigate against risk. So <clears throat> it's the use machine learning for human species, planetary ecosystem flourishing, which we think is a really important use of machine learning. Um, and so on the design side, we look at this idea of geospatial data, which I lovingly call a kind of a lasagna stack of really important information. So first, you know about the land, there's parcels, which is sort of the legal documents reflecting entitlement, who owns it, et cetera. Then there's the zoning, which is typically, obviously the government influence on what's you know, legally possible on that land um, in terms of whether it's zoned for agriculture only or, or mixed use, those kinds of things. Then there's topography, which is the shape obviously of the land, the geology, um, there's hydrology, there's um, the surrounding you know, areas of, of, of demographics and traffic patterns and things like this, the you know, more of the land cover and these other things that really make up the overarching, I'd say base map of the full stack of data. Now this geospatial data in many ways and is also improving and evolving and becoming much more open source and much more um, capable of being crawled and analyzed for the purposes that we're talking about here, which is to overlay now a, a kind of initially a, a primitive, but, but starting point village context. So the village OS would take that information, take relevant architectural kit of parts from that part of the world, that's circular building materials, that's passive uh, typology design, uh, architecturally agnostic in terms of actual sort of, let's say aesthetic to start with, but for the most part, the nuts and bolts and functionality can be expressed you know, in these models. In so much so that we can allow the farmer, the aging farmer, the landowner, their family, you know, lay people without any skills whatsoever can start to design a neighborhood and a village on their land and imagine what's possible there and then start to invite in other stakeholders, right? And when they start to invite other stakeholders, it gets really interesting because you start to have the, the objectives of other stakeholders. It could be residential real estate developer. Well, they have their financial interests and then they've got the finance people who you know, invest and support the development of those new build and retrofits. Then you've got, of course, the government and getting them involved, hopefully in an early enough stage that they're able to start to, to, to also you know, put their objectives into, the, into the, that mix. And then of course the neighbors, because the neighbors are a big discussion wherever you go around the world, the people have their concerns and their interests. And, and, and so basically being able to have a, a virtual sandbox where all of this information can be um, not only seen, but toggled, their objectives can be adjusted. And then the software takes those suggestions, reanalyzes, re-simulates, and displays the updated village based on that input. The goal really being reduce the rhetoric, move faster to planning on the right kinds of community developments that are regenerative, resilient, self-reliant, and, and be able to, um, to really leverage machine learning in such a way that we, we change the rules. Agricultural land that's very strict and handcuffed can be, can be eased and people can start to build the right kind of communities. So by way of example, visual examples, I think are always helpful. Here is a uh, 25 hectare, 60 acre generic parcel of land somewhere from around the world. Um, and essentially it's fallow, farmland, maybe it's been farmed before organically or traditionally, conventionally, whatever it is. But basically it's handcuffed, zoned, 
agricultural only. And what we're saying is that we, we wanna look at this because of the fact that wherever you go around the world, suburban sprawl is eating up farmland and it's taking over in very bad ways. The wrong kind of neighborhood developments are being built as suburbs, car culture, energy wasting, um, and, and, and um, all kinds of polluting producing communities. So instead being able to virtually simulate, right, a 400 plus home community on that 25 hectares where the, all those things are really considered in terms of being able to offer one third of the land for housing density would be apartments, townhomes, row houses, social affordable access as well, very important for us, but also where more than two thirds of that land is really allocated to bioproductive, uh, organic biodynamic soil-based farming, non-till soil, uh, controlled environment farming, um, aquaponic aquaculture systems, but also clean water, renewable energy microgrids, um, the, this, this idea of, of smart mobility and connectivity to smart mobility, all of these things in the aggregate can make this 25 hectare, 60 acre, 400 home community potentially self-reliant in case of district power outages, water interruptions, food disruptions, um, pretty much you name it. The idea really is to make these communities be safe and safer in case of those kinds of things. From an urban perspective, because we get this question all the time, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm from New York originally, so I don't wanna leave my family members behind, but essentially we look at taking um, these very, very challenging urban environments and looking at possibilities for and opportunities for regreening, for what can be done to block by block, building by building, create the circumstances for renewable energy, clean water capture and harvesting, a um, certain amount of composting, waste digestion, wherever you possibly can, creating uh, some, some uh, soil-based and, uh, and controlled environment farming and ag, sufficient enough that these communities get a sense of sustenance but moreover, again, that they can be islanded for some number of days or even longer in case of other disruptions and interruptions. Now, if you can start to map like cities like this, we have a, a, a better fighting chance, we think, with 2 billion more people coming to earth. Cities and the new build, so retrofit and new build. Um, and again, I always go back to these farm to table experiences because it's always about the biodiversity and the celebration of life and this whole idea of having all different kinds of protein sources and nutrition that also aerate the soil, also contribute to um, the health of the soil and preserving that soil, which is so critical. And a lot of people just don't really understand that traditional farming, conventional farming is really not good for, for the soil or for the planet. Um, and that's why we mix non-till soil, organic biodynamic patchwork quilt of farming with the controlled environment farming and greenhouses that can have um, aquaponic, aeroponic systems. These are systems that are fully circular. So the fish, the crawfish, the shrimp, freshwater species, their waste uh, turns uh, from ammonia with a light biological interaction, you extract that water and it's converted to nitrites. And then, and then again into nitrates. And the nitrate of course is a very um, nutrient rich fertilizer for, for plants. And so that effluent uh, with the nitrate water is then uh, pumped with a low energy water pump to the top of these lattices. The plants are fed, uh, the roots dangle in, you know, in this effluent. And the water comes back to the tanks, to the fish tanks purified, makes the fish happy and the other species of aquatic uh, uh, protein happy. But at the same time, it also makes the cultivars happy. There's another piece to this, right? 
And that other piece to this is vermiculture, is actually digesting food and animal waste using black soldier fly larvae and aquatic worms. Um, these are creatures that eat their own weight every day in food and animal waste. Um, but then essentially they are the perfect food for the chickens and the fish and the other small animals, right? Because these um, are high in protein, omega-3, fat, calcium, uh, and, and it's just a very uh, beneficial circular environment, which is, again, everything we're striving for is syntropy. So we'll go back to that word in the very beginning of the talk. Um, and, you know, discussing, discussion about the, the uh, built environment, again, you know, the, the context, culturally speaking, you know, obviously in India, you would see different kind of construction than this probably, um, and different construction materials than this in some ways, but the goal really is that the homes are passive, that we can create them and outline them in such a way that they can be built um, rapidly, but also cost-effectively so that we can have access, social affordable access to this kind of living. And this is really critical from us, from our perspective, because it's not just about regenerative resiliency for that top wealthy, population in the world, right? Um, it's about regenerative resiliency for the rest of us. And how can we celebrate the best parts of life by living in these kinds of communities? And so what I mean by precision construction, there's a wonderful you know, revolution that's been taking place called prefab. Uh, and prefab is, are typically these, these controlled environment manufacturing plants where they're using either robotics or at least precision laser cutting technologies to um, minimize construction waste and, and reduce that by about a third, which is huge. If you think about 30% of a new house is going into a dumpster. That's typically what's happening with stick build. There's so much waste overcutting and, and, and waste around the whole process. So that's huge savings right there. Um, and also for the environment. Then the other is the fact that once you put together these components, and you can see they're really like Lego pieces, whether they're, they're a component, wall unit, or volumetric, you know, volumetric being like bathroom, bedroom, kitchen, you know, all in one kind of box trucked in. They go up very, very quickly. Um, I mean, you know, we've seen some of these residential towers and some of these, you know, um, housing communities using prefab they can go up in a matter of just a couple of weeks. Uh, and that's just, again, a, a huge savings that ought to be passed on to the, the future homeowners and renters and residents in these communities. We're really shooting for this idea of um, how we can live within nature and not separate from it, right? And, and that everything we design, everything we think about through the Village OS software, has that as its objectives, as its rules. Um, there's another part of this a question that we get all the time, which is, oh, if you live in one of these communities, you know, are you forced to be, you know, a farmer or a gardener or or have to like work? Um, no, you don't. I mean, the idea really being uh, that you pay a monthly fee as part of your your mortgage, your rent, whatever it is, and that covers your energy bill, your water bill, your, your, your waste to resource bill, you know, certain amount of organic food that we can produce uh, that comes to your, your doorstep a couple times a week. Um, and then we use that economic ledger that those people who do want to get involved, that we can have those ledgers, they can be tasks that, um, that they can essentially, they or their family members can do different things. And at the end of each month, the tallies, and it can reduce their their, their burden, you know, financial burden in the community. Uh, another great lever too, also for, for social and affordable access to these communities. So I love this whole idea of food and healthy food, especially that you see where it's coming from, you have access to agency with, that this is actually a very disarming topic. It actually enables people of diverse cultures 
races, ethnicities, backgrounds, religions, whatever it may be, that they can come together and through recipes, which are stories and about people's ancestry and things like this, the aromas, the flavors, people don't even have to speak the same language. They can come to these tables and, and be together. And I think that's really, really important. It's a, it's a gradient for happiness and health um, to, to be doing these kinds of things. There's another key piece to this too, which is aging in place, right? This whole concept of assisted living and um, senior living is really anathema to it takes a village. And, and so my research basically parallels what are called blue zones around the world, which are where people are living to like 100, 110, never seeing doctor, never taking pharmaceuticals. And it's because they have maybe some soil under their fingernails, which, are, which has been proven also to, to increase happiness and health. But they also feel connected to multi-generational communities. They feel like they have a purpose, they have wisdom, they're part of something. And that's really, really key. And also germane, by the way, to my current affiliation at Stanford, which is in the School of Medicine, which is at the Center for Compassion, Altruism, Research and Education, or C-Care, under Dr. James Doty. So um, my, my role is, is Director of Compassionate Sustainability, which is a lovely title, um, essentially because we're, everything we're talking about here is how we live and where we live that can reduce amygdala response, right, in the brain. Now, amygdala response is that fight or flight syndrome, okay, which we feel like I think most of the world, the human population is pretty much under multiple times a day. We're getting these, these responses that we really need to be stressed about or tense about. But if we can diminish that and inhibit that and reduce that, then it reduces what's called cortisol. Cortisol release is really bad for our health. And that cortisol release is, um, is essentially what, what eventually will, will age us and bring us all kinds of infirmities. So it is really about the nature of these communities that, that really inspires me and the regard to open space as a value system, right? Because you talk to any residential real, real estate developer and the only time they're interested in talking about open space is if it relates to a golf course or a ski area, right? Or a shooting range or something, I don't know. It doesn't have, it doesn't deal with, with um, resiliency and regenerative productivity as, as an amenity, which is again, something we're really off to now try to inspire in, in, in the real estate development community and with governments as well around the world. So uh, we're our Dutch company. I've spent quite a bit of time in Europe. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely a very big proponent of cafe lifestyle, cafe culture, you know, something really powerful and visceral. You wake up in the morning and you smell the bread being baked or the coffee brewing and and, and you know, these casual collisions can happen and, and people can, can come together. And again, it's really you know, inspired in a lot of ways by, by food and recipes. You can all think about in your own lives, you know, where, when you feel like you've been the happiest. You know, when is that? Is it like, isn't it like being with friends and family around something delicious? And maybe even something that you grew or helped to grow or harvested or helped cook. These are really important things. Um, raising children, uh, you know, to be able to, to understand when you look at these communities and research that I've done, you know, around the world, the, you know, essentially it's amazing. You go into the, into the community center, a lot of these eco villages and intentional communities have these central buildings or large homes, which are the, the, um, the community center, right? And you'll see on the community center, these boards, uh, event boards and announcements. And you see birth announcements. Uh, maybe before that, you'll see engagements. Then you'll see the birth announcement. Uh, then you see the, the whole idea of, of you know, celebrations, graduations, parties, people retiring, people getting older. And then, you know, then there's like announcements about hospice care and death. 
And, and there's this beautiful story arc that we, we shouldn't be afraid of. This is life. And we, we celebrate that, that we have connectivity again to the elders who are there for our children and our children who are there for our elders. And, but most importantly, that kids who grow up in these kinds of communities know where things come from and they know where things go. They understand that circularity in life. And we are so disassociated from this. Our species has never been more disassociated from the natural world than we are right now, pretty much. Um, speaking of that, uh, we get to the idea and the topic about uh, autonomous, level five autonomous mobility. Here where I am at Stanford uh, in Palo Alto, California, there's probably no less than 20 or so uh, different kinds of autonomous vehicle companies from the tiny little robots doing food deliveries to the, to the, to the autonomous vehicles and cars, drones, et cetera. And, and so we understand that this kind of transit will be ubiquitous. It will be everywhere, probably within the next 10 years. And I would even imagine sooner than that. Um, and so there's no reason to design anymore for garages and driveways and, and this whole concept of car ownership, because that's gonna really go away. It's gonna be mobility as a service, mobility on demand. And, and furthermore, we're gonna to start to see more and more this idea of drone deliveries and drone taxis being the, the kind of synapse in terms of reinvigorating local regional supply chains, okay? I'm sure everyone here, we all lived through COVID, you know, and we all also saw the supply chain disruptions. There was COVID that caused hoarding. People went a little crazy in my country, toilet paper for some reason, I don't know, but other places it was, you know, the shelves started to go bare uh, for a lot of people in different parts of the world. Then uh, following concurrent to that was, was uh, some blockages to the Suez Canal, um, you know, that, that some a container ship got stuck in the wrong direction and literally blocked some global supply chains for, for a matter of, of like uh, a few weeks. And, and it had cascading effects, again, on the shelf spaces. People started to see shelves going bare. And now, of course, with the war in, in Ukraine uh, caused by, by Russia, you have a, a real situation where, um, where, where supply chains are even further impacted. So we feel like it's now the moment to be awakened to this fact that every one of these kinds of communities that we can design, implement, and build and operate around the world will be a net producer, over producer of abundant surplus. And that this network then of regional communities that are overproducing power, water, food, et cetera, that they have this kind of ability then to create nation state security from that kind of, 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 of independence really. So we have to be cognizant that we can no longer rely on shipping lanes and, and aircraft lane, landing and bringing us these things and these items from all around the world. We have to be again, learning to be more self-reliant. So, um, you know, the basis of Regen Villages in many ways is, is a focus not just on the, um, the, the design of the communities, but we would be uh, remiss if we also didn't consider the financial aspects, right? Um, and so it's important for us to understand that there, that there are these, um, these green bonds and there are these incredible opportunities where, where sovereign wealth and pension funds and others are beginning to invest in these kinds of residential developments. And we have to be prepared to be able to offer the, the financial outcome that makes sense. It's not an extractive, it's patient debt finance, and it's combined with you know, what's called ESG, which is um, environmental social governance impact and SDG, which is the UN sustainable development goal impact. Um, Regen Villages has been a part of 
the um, UN Climate Secretariat, the UNFCCC since uh, 2019. We presented at COP26 in Glasgow uh, in 2020. We, we presented at, at uh, uh, COP27 in Cairo um, most recently, and uh, hopefully we'll be again presenting in a more pronounced way coming up at COP28 uh, at, um, in Dubai, which is really important because we feel quite honestly that a lot of things are gonna start to come out of uh, the UAE and also Saudi Arabia because of their very heavy investments now um, out of fossil fuels into other kinds of development that we feel are, are you know, pivotal for the world around us. So I think what I'll do is I'll leave it there and, um, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to, uh, to speak. And now I will just show you this slide for those folks who wanna get in touch with me. Always happy to, to say hi um, and, and be connected. But um, I guess we'll, we'll, take the, we'll start taking questions. I'm not sure if the questions are gonna be moderated or I just have to read them and answer them myself. Are you gonna moderate? I'll stop sharing. Yeah, thanks, thanks, James. Sure, we will uh, moderate the questions. I mean, like, first of all, the brilliant session. Uh, I mean, I am, I personally want to live in a region village myself. So, and, and I really love the concept of circularity, how we are so dissociated with that. I think, you know, that's essentially what's really taking away a lot of things from us and the, the, the compassion, this is, and, and the whole idea of regenerating and sustainability. So awesome. So I think I have some questions. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks here. Thanks for joining this. I hope you like this session. So now we're starting with the Q&A. But before that, we'll have a quick poll just to understand how AI and ML, we have been uh, hearing about it a lot, just to ensure how AI and ML is going to impact our futures. So quick poll for everyone here. Yeah. Comment. More questions are right now. I'm sure everyone can see the poll on the screen, Sam. So please feel free to answer. It just gives an idea how important is AI literacy and how can AI uh, solve the problems in agriculture, food, and in general, uh, how it can impact the future of living. So we can start seeing the results as well already. Of course, uh, there's no denial. Uh, AI is going to change our lives. Um, AI is an enabler. I'm mean, like, we shouldn't be threatened by it. I'm sure this is one of the questions, you know, we would definitely want to hear from you, James. Uh, we have a couple of questions which have come from our other live streams which are happening directly with some universities. Also, we have people here who are uh, live in this webinar. So we would like to start with the first question which is like, how do you think, I mean, should we be afraid of AI? And do you think AI is, is a friend here? Well, any technology uh, can be used for good or for bad, right? Um, I, I think it's important to understand, and I think we should be calm, first of all, that's always important, but, um, Oxford did a study about a decade ago, decade plus ago, uh, that predicted that uh, due to AI and machine learning that 47% of all employment globally will not exist anymore. And, um, and that, would, that was basically predicted 20 years from 10 years ago. So they're somewhere within 10 years from now, that's kind of what they're anticipating. Um, however, the study has been, have been revised and, um, and now essentially it's closer to 80% of all employment won't exist anymore. And it's not coming back as something else. Um, and it's not just, uh, you know, manufacturing jobs and, you know, the things you would imagine a robot would do and take away uh, or, or even uh, the autonomous driving technologies, which would take away a swath of millions and millions of jobs around the world from all the kinds of, uh, lorry drivers and van drivers, delivery, et cetera, uh, taxi drivers, et cetera. There's the, you know, professors, you know, have to be worried 
Um, lawyers have to be worried. Uh, doctors, I mean, eventually the, the intelligence of these systems will, will really overtake um, the, the way we've been thinking about things. And so what are we gonna do? And again, I'm a solution optimist. I believe that everything we've shown this, this, this presentation is about creating the circumstances for communities that can support people's sustenance, right? That base level of Maslow hierarchical needs, right? That you can support yourself and your family, that you feel safe, that you have dignified housing, all of that. And that COVID proved actually um, that governments are capable of providing something called UBI, which is universal basic income. And, and that, that that income can then help people uh, think about new economic models, new ways forward. So I want to imagine a, a better outcome than other people do. And that outcome really is to convert the logic of work and jobs as a metric to self-worth, right? And that people have an opportunity to grow spiritually, emotionally, uh, um, physically, that they're capable of being able to, to help others. They're being able to think and innovate and come up with interesting ideas. And, and that can only happen when you reduce that amygdala response. That can only happen. Compassion is spurred. Generosity is spurred by sustenance. When people feel taken care of, they feel generous. That's just, that's just the way things are. So that's my, my take on, on that question. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. I mean, that's really enlightening. Uh, quickly taking a couple of questions here. So the first question is from Hariram. And the question is how the AIML work or in developing countries like India, do you see any any restriction, any limitation in implementation of that? Um, I think you know we we have a um, the the design challenge we have is not small. It's a big one, right? Because the the geospatial layers that I shared with you earlier, there's a certain amount that we're able to get from space, you know, from satellite. We're a certain amount we're able to get on the ground itself uh, at, a, at a sort of uh, topographic level. Um, but there's certain things we need below the ground. There's certain information that may not be available to a farmer or a landowner or a real estate developer or whatever it is, or even a government, that, that certain information has to be explored, um, including archeological or other things. So. I, I think whether it's in India or whether it's in Germany or whether it's in the US, these complications will still be there, right? Um, I do, however, believe that we can use machine learning to create inferences. And the inferences are, well, the neighbor there discovered this and the neighbor there discovered this. And so you begin to triangulate and you're able to make some assumptions. It may not be 100% accurate, but you'd be, I think, pretty darn close to being able to model what you need to model um, in advance of having to do those other kinds of studies. But I think it's a great question. And, um, and I think we really get back down to, to the rules and the regulations. That's what we have to fix. That's what we have to change. Absolutely. And maybe in India, it's easier. Yeah, I mean, like things are really changing very fast. The whole protocols, how the government functions, how the university functions, how the education and the literacy around AI, the acceptance in general, I mean, that's really changing so fast, so fast. Of course, on not only on the technology level, but also on the policy level, we'll start seeing these changes. And then of course, these limitations will just evaporate. Okay, going to the next question. I think this also answers Mr. R.P. Merutra's question, which is pretty much the same. A suggestive self-sustained community habitation layout in minimum land space. Any comment, James, on this? 
on oh, minimum, on minimum land space. Yeah, that's a, that's a you know, just keep throwing those design challenges at us. That sounds great. I love that. Um, yeah, that's that is definitely a a big one for us. Um, what I showed in my example, sort of the urban, you know, landscape, which is which is horrible, right? It's mostly concrete, tar, um, non fruit food bearing uh, foliage. If you if it's there at all. Um, and what can you do, you know, block by block? So that's one thing. We've been looking at some smaller plot community design challenges and, and trying to see what's possible, what we can do. And, and really what it comes down to is, it's, it seems to me, and it, pretty much everyone that I talk to as well, that every little bit matters. And so whatever we can do, however we can do it, it's going to be better than what was there before. So I think that's really the answer in yep. the current form of where things are at right now. In terms of where things are going and in the future, I think there's a, I want to be excited about technology and what's possible. And what I really feel like we'll be able to come up with some amazing um, solutions. I just do. Before we go to the next question, and we keep this enthusiasm and excitement about technology, we also have a lot of students today in this, in this webinar. And these are students from agriculture, horticulture, and whatnot in other domains, and also from engineering, AI, and um, uh, computer science domains as well. So we would like to hear from you, I'm like, what, what's your message to a student? If they really want to build a career, I'm like, students are really confused, okay? So they, they really want to understand if I want to build a career and also as a habitant of this world, what is it that we should focus on that we really understand AI, live with it and also build a great career in AI and ML? Uh, it's one thing if you're interested in, in coding and learning about uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotics, that's, I think, a very thankful place to, to consider if you're already thinking about that, if that's something interesting. Um, I think the, the world of robotics especially is going to get better and better as the technologies get more efficient and cheaper so that the, the AI and the ML are able to actually drive and inform those robots, right? We're seeing that now, we're seeing that now happen. So I think that's, that's an important thing for those people who are interested in that. Um, for other people, and I'm sure I can hear a lot of, you know, sort of Indian parents yelling at me right now for whatever I'm about to say, but basically um, I think we have one huge advantage over AI and ML and robots, which is, which is our heart and our soul. And, and I really want to, to continue to, to sort of promote this idea of compassion and altruism and empathy. First and foremost, we have to have it within ourselves, towards ourselves, um, no matter what our parents are yelling at us to do or not do. I mean, I had one parent wanted me to be a doctor, another one wanted me to be a lawyer. And I mean, if I listened to both of them, I would be suing myself for malpractice, I guess. I don't know. Um, but I chose my own path, okay? And I know that's not easy, culturally speaking, right, uh, to do that. Um, but the world needs heart-centered people. You know, we need people who are interested in philosophy and poetry and art and music. Um, I, just, I just really feel that we, we have to be thinking less about jobs and careers because they're not thinking about us, they're not. Um, you know, the moment there's a robot or a, or a system that can replace X number of whatever it is that's coming out of college right now, that's a, that's a painful realization. So, so we have to care deeply for each other. We have that capability. That's my, that's my answer to that question. So you're saying that even if we are pursuing AIML, we still understand what compassion is and our heart into whatever that we pursue. 
Exactly. Well, that's one of the things we're, we're trying really hard to do. And I can't say we're successful at it yet, but we're trying hard, right? The trying hard part is what's, what's I think, most important many times. And that's to inform uh, AI and ML data models with this idea of compassion, altruism, mindfulness, that they can appreciate, right? Um, what it means to, to, to be focusing on better outcomes for, for um, ecosystems, especially in planet. So this, it, it's a direct connection to, to sustainability and, and regenerative thinking. Okay, cool. Before we go to the next question, so guys, I think you know we will have another 30 minutes of the Q&A. We'll, we'll, we'll take it to 12 p.m. India time. I also have the, the poll results and I'm sure everybody can see them. So I share them here. Yes, I, I think everybody can see them now. I think 79% believe that AI literacy is important for everyone. 16% are a maybe and 4% are a no. I'm really concerned about the people who are no. So maybe I understand you are, you are yes. What do you think of people about who are, who are no here? I, I, I like the fact that there's 4% who said no. Um, I'm curious about that. You know, um, I think it's, I find it to somebody, be really- I mean, like, we, can, we can pull up somebody. I mean, like if, if somebody who has said no to all the, because there are eight people specifically who said no to all the questions which say that AI can actually solve problems. And essentially 67 to 70% have said that, yes, it's going to solve problems. And again, 20, 25% are, are sort of maybe. Uh, so then going to the next question, if somebody really wants to ask your question in person, I can pull you up as a panelist and you can share your video as well. We can do that with two, three people and then we can take up other questions as well, just to make it more. Yeah, I, I think the 4% I think is clear because the question that you ask is, do you think if AI literacy is important, Mm -hmm. And and I think the answer, the four percent, I think some portion of that four percent is probably the no is because of the fact that they are comfortable with it doing whatever you know we want it to do. Okay. So they don't have to learn about it. That's a perspective. That that's really because yes, saying yeah, okay, fine, I'm already literate, but still in that sense, I'm mean, like, oh, maybe I don't really care. Okay, so if somebody really wants to join uh, as a panelist, okay, I can see some hands. One sec. You can raise your hand and I can pull you up. Okay, uh, I'm taking up Mr. Hari up here, but I think I, I did take one of your questions. Let me see. So you can join now as a panelist and I'll take two, three more people after this. Please share your video, Mr. Hiram, and I'm taking myself off from this pin. You should be able to join as a panelist, Hariram. Okay. Yes, he's joining. Please enable your video and unmute yourself. So if you're facing any technical challenges, we can pull up someone else. Okay, I think, yes, we can see you. Hi Hello. there. Hello. Unmute yourself, please. So you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. So you're not audible still. Yeah, don't hear you. So not audible. 
You know what to say. Okay. No, I don't think your microphone is working. Yes. Your mic you want to try without the without the hands free? You want to try without the microphone, sir? You have to you have to unjack it from your computer. You can remove it from your computer. And just try. I think so. We will have to take somebody. I mean, like, I have seen a question already. Still can't hear me. There's some problem with the audio, Ram, sir. Uh, we are not able to hear you. So, You're not audible. we have already have your question here, which was about the same, the same, the question was about this only where how AI ML will work in developing countries in India. Is that the question you want to ask? Because we, we kind of discussed. Pretty unfortunate, so we are running out of time. So I'm really sorry, uh, your uh, microphone is not working. So I'll have to pull up someone else. Thank you so much, sir. but I really apologize for this. Happens, technical problems. Really sorry about that. Hope AI and ML can fix this automatically. Not sure about that. Okay, I'm so putting you back in. Tarp, sir, can we take Dr. Monet Kumar's question? Yes, yes abs absolutely. We can. We can. Take. I'm putting you still here. I'm, I'm putting up someone else. So meanwhile, you can fix your this thing and let me know if once it's done. Yeah, please pull. Can you pull him, Kulika? I, I think he's put a question. I was. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I can see the question, but yeah. not yeah. raise the hand. So I'm okay. taking up Dr. Kali Chiran Rat. All right. All right. Sure. I mean, I do see questions in the in the Q and A. Too. Yes. Meanwhile, you can see some questions. You want to address them. You can address them while we face with these technical challenges. So typical. So. Um, I see. There's the questions of the the importance of an API, in Regen Villages. Um, that's am I audible, sir? Yes, you are. Yes, you yeah, are. Namaste. namaste. It's a good, very nice session. Uh, only one thing I, I want to know uh, that suggestion from you that AI is a blessing to the society or AI will gender it harmful in the coming future to the society. Yeah, I, I think sure. It's it's uh, it's it's gonna be both. I mean, unfortunately, we have we have you know, military and, and industrial military complex doing everything they can to push forward smart uh, military technology that's using AI. That's terrifying. Um, there's, there's all kinds of employers who are going to, who are to install this and, and as an excuse then to, to, to reduce their uh, payroll. And that's going to be uh, incredible <laughs> shockwave to to global economies, um, and so we have to we have this wonderful opportunity on the other side to try to create these places and this lifestyle that enables the use of machine learning in support of human planetary flourishing. So it's a great question, and I I I, I I'm also kind of surprised at at how rapid things are moving. You know, there's Moore's law, if you're familiar with Moore's law, which is technically things just keep getting better and better and cheaper and cheaper, right? Um, but this AI uh, buzz that's happening right now and, and things that are going on with, with, with AI and ML development is unprecedented in human history. I've never seen anything like it. So. That's why we're we're trying to breakneck speed to inform it with, you know, with, hey, calm down, you know, okay, so let's yeah, let's actually, do. Actually, what, yeah, actually, what happens? The chart GPT and other AI tools are coming to picture, and that will be helpful to the the little bit of solution uh, for the industries as well as the academic line also. So, yeah. a fairness of this, a fairness or a challenge is coming that uh, that there must be a uh, scarcity in the job supply. That means that surely we will pass, going to face a top challenge for, uh, through the bottleneck position where the academic uh, students will face the problem for their recruitment uh, in the industries. 
So how to tackle that one, sir, in this scenario? Because technology is the most challenging and the developing. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, there, there's there's technologies now that are capable of assessing whether people are using ChatGPT and other you know AI to to do their homework, to do their schoolwork. Um, there was a lawyer who got caught this last week in the U.S. doing something stupid, trying to to you know, pass some fake uh, case law uh, generated synthetically by ChatGPT to to a judge, and um, and that lawyer is probably going to get disbarred. And sanctioned for it. So fortunately, you know, ChatGPT is like at the sort of two-year-old stage. It's not very mature. It's kind of speaking gibberish. Uh, but believe you me, in a very short period of time, these systems are going to just devour information from around the world. They're going to learn. They're going to be able to really fool a lot of people uh, that they're not coming from, from, from an actual person or people. So we have our challenges ahead of us, but, but we're, we're fighting the good fight for, for, from a sustainability perspective and regenerative resiliency perspective to use machine learning to help people, to help the planet. Thanks, James, and thanks for the Thank questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Rath. Uh, Shubham, would you like to take the stage? I'm putting you. You can un unmute yourself. Hello. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Shabam Soni from ICR CIT Mumbai. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you are. Uh, yeah. Uh, my questions are regarding uh, the waste management that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning can help us through. Uh, we are seeing uh, many cities in uh, Europe, India, uh, USA, and uh, other parts of the world, they are uh, making uh, smart dustbins and uh, the smart waste management system. And so how can we use the AI and machine learning in agriculture and especially in fisheries, because I come from fisheries. So in how can we deal with waste management uh, using AI in the fisheries? Uh, well, I mean, you know, we look at aquaponic systems, which are, which are, you know, in a way are decoupled from aquaculture, right? So this aquaponic, which is essentially helping to, to put nutrients into the, the cultivars while also creating a certain amount of, of, of protein. But, but really we separate that from and bifurcate that with aquaculture, which is really dedicated systems. And those systems do produce uh, waste, right? Um, which is you know, a, co a combination of, of things which have to be uh, mitigated and remediated. Um, and, and, and so we see, again, the opportunity to, um, to create uh, a kind of mechanism where a lot of these systems you know, have been implemented where we can improve how the water from these systems is circulated, is extracted, where the ammonia and the other um, polluting elements are, are removed, the, the, you know, the effluent and the, and the physical, and then being able to, to um, basically recirculate the purified water back in to, to the tanks without disrupting you know, the species uh, that are in those tanks because it can be very sensitive um, to, to any kind of disruption. So it's, you know, again, trying to create continuity. So we think that we know that machine learning loves that complexity, right? Um, it's also with, with, we've seen some really interesting work with um, computer vision and being able to look within fish tanks and remarkably be able to say, okay, this fish uh, isn't doing so well, or this fish looks pretty plump. I think this one should probably come out um, or this one you know, is having some other issues, whatever it may be. And being able to catalog and understand all those different, those fish in those tanks. I mean, talk about chaos theory, right? And being able to, to, to track that. So machine learning is going to get better and better at these things and provide um, tools for, for folks like you that would enable to, to, to operate those aquaculture systems better. So we feel like that's a, an important piece. We, you know, we're focusing on the, um, the neighborhood scale waste to resource management. So it's not just animal waste, um, which can be digested in lots of different ways, 
in terms of converting to both anaerobic digestion, but also biomass, biogas. Um, these are all, you know, really interesting syntropic sources, right? To 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 achieve things from. So it's a combination of things. Everything we talk about really in in is like an ecosystem. You know, you try to put one piece and then trying to put several pieces around it that help that system flourish. So I think that's really what we think machine learning can help with to help design and understand what can improve the, that, that flow. Does that make sense? Yeah, Thanks that, for your question. Nice, those were nice insights on this topic. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Sure. Pulling Dr. Pooja. Yes. Yeah, hi, Dr. Pooja. Can you hear us? Uh, hi. Yeah, I yeah, can. Can you please switch on your camera? Yeah, sure. And ask your question. Uh, hi, James. Hello, everyone. Uh, see, as uh, I'm a professor in a university, and we have a lot of students uh, here doing engineering or uh, uh, like graduation or post graduation. So my question is like a lot of, uh, you know, uh, like a uh, lot of new technology has come related to AI. So what are the ethical boundaries or limitations that should be considered when, uh, when these students are doing their assignments and implementing any of the projects? So how, how can we you know, uh, make some ethical boundaries for these students in the educational setting? Yeah, I, I don't, it's hard for me to say in, in a lot of ways because I feel that the students ought to have access to these technologies and be able to, to embrace them, right? right? So that they're, they're, that they're, but they, that ethically they need to be able to like anything else, be able to, to uh, cite how it was used and the process that they used it in. Um, no different than any other kind of research. You cannot plagiarize. You have to, uh, to be a good actor, right? And you have to, in these academic settings, know those boundaries. And I don't think that AI is any different. I think you have to be able to say, I'm going to use this, talk to the professor, I'm going to use, whether it's chat GPT or some other kind of um, AI ML, you know, data model. And this is how I intend to use it. And this is how I'm going to express the research results or the R and D results. And um, as long as they're not pretending, I don't think, then it's, it's fine. I think she, there was some issue, yeah. but I think- uh, It was a great question though. Question, so thank great you. question, yeah. absolutely. The same, that was a great question and it's a great answer as well. Uh, pulling up the next candidate and after that, I think, you know, James, you have a lot of questions in the Q&A. I would leave it up to you to pick up the best ones and answer after I pull up uh, Vinayak here. Sure. Can you please use your camera? Yeah, five minutes. Am I, am I audible? Yes. yes. Go ahead. Okay, uh, so for one, I just wanted to say that uh, everything that is shared was very valuable and very knowledgeable. But something that has been really uh, like been confusing me is how sustainable will the will the deployment of these new technologies be in the coming world? Like for example, we already know how much pure water Chat GPT is consuming for every twenty two questions. And this and that amount of water is being used when we're talking about a website which hosts an AI chat application. Like that is how small it is. So when we will be implying AI into much larger deployments on massive scale, how sustainable will that be, and how economic will that be for for the long run? It's a great. It really is another amazing question, and it's it's always been also my 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 big sort of fight or battle against sort of cryptocurrency and, and other technologies, Web3, you know, because it's just so much, you know, data that requires crunching and requires electrons and requires uh, fossil fuel power and water and all these wonderful things that you just mentioned are, are being used to, to drive this, these kinds of systems. Um, the goal really is to 
as much as possible to derive consensus and to, and to, to enable uh, machine learning in a way that is essentially federated so that we can, we can distribute with low, across low power systems enough to, to get to the answers we're looking for. And um, I think those are the kinds of, 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 of systems that will, will really be sustainable and regenerative in, in, this, in this world. So it's an amazing question and it's really, really thoughtful of you because to be perfectly honest, people don't realize how much Zoom eats power and power costs fuel and fuel costs all kinds of things. So um, it's not just Zoom, but everything else, whether you're on your phone, playing a video game, whatever it may be, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a consequence and, and nobody really, not a lot of people really think about that. So, so thanks for the question. Appreciate that. In fact, yes, Vinay, this is very, very interesting questions, very unusual thought. I'm like just, I'm just intrigued. I'm like, you know, are you a student from which college, which university? Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm from Ramjas International School. You were still so, in school, school? Yeah, I'm still in school. Yeah. Where to go? Where to go, kid? <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations and, and keep, keep your enthusiasm and your intriguing nature, your curiosity for things that will really take you. Sure, sir. Actually, this will be my field. I want to become a, an engineer in the field of AI and AI specialist. So that's why um, I have to, you know, as an engineer, be aware of what are the side effects of the work which I'm doing. So, yeah. Good, good, good question. Thank you so much. Uh, I am going to take up certain questions from... Uh, mm -hmm. you want to, do you want to read some questions uh, from the uh, Q&A? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's one that, you know, I talked about land space before, but it was just, you know, I really feel that, you know, in many ways, India has this wonderful opportunity to celebrate the rural, the peri-urban and the rural, uh, and to, to, to get there and to create these thriving, flourishing, rejuvenated infrastructure-based communities on, around regenerative infrastructure that can allow people to, to not have to migrate to the urban rings, right? Where they end up in those rings of poverty, typically. Um, moreover, that they can be drawn back out from those rings of poverty to their rural villages and find sustenance and have, and have their, their, their children are able to go to school, that they're able to support you know, the day-to-day the, the -day needs of their families. This is what people want in life. At the end of the day, people want to know that they're safe, that their, their families are safe, their kids, their elders, pets, animals, whatever it is. Everybody wants to feel like they're, they're part of something. Um, and, and the urban areas, uh, they're, they're not that shining, glimmering example any longer of, of a future in a, lot, in a lot of ways, I don't think, that, that is accepting of the masses coming from, from the rural areas anymore. So I think that's an important point is about what we can do um, together uh, in India. So we've had some conversations with, with folks at Jindal and with Tata and um, because we feel like there is in, in many ways an importance of coming from sort of a top-down perspective, you know, in India. Um, James, we would, we would love to collaborate. I'm like, and if you really need some help connecting with, with the correct uh, stakeholders in India. And also a lot of universities, let me tell you, some of the people who are here, they are like vice chancellors, deans, directors of some very promising universities in India. And- The thing about universities that, that are great, that, sorry to interrupt, the things about universities that are great, um, sort of different from Stanford, but that is that they have land. And the land can be used Absolutely. for student, faculty, housing. We can build these kinds of neighborhoods that as proof points and then you know be able to to replicate and scale. So so we're we're really interested in that. We're really interested in this in in solving this problem. And I really feel like by doing it in India, that we can we can show the rest of the world in a lot of ways how it's done. Great. So um, like you know, just a shout out to the audience. If anybody wants to collaborate with James on his work and on region villages, please feel free to drop us an email. 
I'm sure James has already shared his email here. We'll be happy to connect and you can take this conversation forward with him. So Lika, please go ahead. Uh, meanwhile, I'll take a five minutes break and I'll be back with other questions. Yeah, I, should I answer more questions or? Yes, yes, of course, yes. Kulika, okay, I see, I see uh, there's a question about any examples of urban farming and significant scale around the world. That's a really good question. I would say Singapore is a really good example of um, urban farming because of the fact that Singapore is, it's an island nation, it's an island state nation. And, um, and they have been trying very hard over the last couple of decades to become essentially a self-reliant, almost self-reliant place because they've had to fly in or, or ship in their sustenance. But they have been doing lots of work, especially in vertical farming. The challenge with vertical farming is it's typically focusing on monoculture and on leafy greens and microgreens and you know, things that, you know, that, that restaurants would previously have to fly in, let's say from the Netherlands or something. Um, but it's not the kind of full menu that we're shooting for. There are other urban examples um, where like in Brooklyn, New York, or out here where I am in, in Oakland, uh, you know, across the bay from me, from Stanford, um, not far from Berkeley University, UC Berkeley, there are some really interesting rooftop, in aggregate, a bunch of rooftops that are producing um, pretty good yield of organic food. Um, but I wanna see, again, our design challenge, which we think is really interesting and unique, is the full menu. How much of the full menu can you derive so that the, for the most part, should there be some kind of interruption or disruption to supply chains, your community is safe? That's, that's really what's interesting for us. So, so adding to that question, I'm like, so can a country like Singapore with limited uh, resources in terms of land, can they actually really do a full menu? I mean, like, even if they have a lot of efforts in vertical farming, is it possible it's, for them? It's tough, you know, they have limited amount of, of, of open land. I mean, of course, the sister country, uh, just, you know, a neighbor to them, Malaysia has plenty of land to do lots of interesting things. Um, but, you know, Singapore itself does not have a lot of available land. But there's, I think there's ways forward that we've seen. The Dutch have done some interesting work. The Dutch do a lot of interesting work around food. That's one Working of the reasons- Working Malaysia also, other nearby countries too. To yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the Dutch have have you know even created like a floating like um, uh, like cattle ranch basically on a barge or barges so that you know there's lots of tiers and the cows have chance to kind of graze and some 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 grass on top and then you know they it's it's really interesting. Then they use the methane for fuel for the barge and and for, for export. So it's there's there's opportunities there. Um, it's, there's still a lot of challenges though with that with that um, full menu concept. Next question. What um, you're adding I see Dr. 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 Yes, Dr. Mishra is online, so maybe he wants to ask me something. Yes, we can take it. Uh, good morning. He's, he's already there. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Mishra. Hi, Dr. Yeah, Mishra. Hi, yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm an Aizen's or you, you as well. Yeah, I'm uh, now at uh, Ethiopia, you know, in the South Africa, that African country. I'm at Ethiopia. Actually, basically, I, I was working at uh, Centurion University in India, Indonesia. So I came for uh, as a Leon from that university. So here, uh, the um, topic was very interesting, and I found it very interesting, and uh, the science as well as this green engineering is together. So can we develop the model here or in Ethiopia is possible? Absolutely. Uh, As a matter of fact, we're, you know, we're um, engaged with a landowner uh, in Centurion, actually, um, who is an African landowner who is running an Actec Institute on his land. It's about 200 hectare, not far from Pretoria. And, and we're essentially, we've started the process of a spatial plan, master plan, uh, sort of traditional architecture and design landscape, permaculture design, but as a mechanism really to teach the Village OS software through that process. So 
Um, so we do have some touch points now in, in South Africa. We have touch points like many places around the world because since 2016, we've been, we've been quite viral um, in, in our, our design thinking um, and, and had a lot of press coverage. So this is a project that we, we hope will, will break ground soon. Um, we're starting first on the, actually on the land, on the permaculture side because of the Ag Tech Institute. Um, so I do think there's some interesting synergy there to talk about uh, in South Africa. And also that Africa has a potential, in South Africa, the ability to, to replicate across the rest of the continent. Um, and that's some of the things we've been talking to also with Tata about, um, actually maybe supporting some of the things we're doing in, in Africa as a means to kind of sneaky way to kind of come back to India. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, another uh, the question is that, so some students wants to do PhD on this area or some students do on the masters in this area. So can it be collaboratively be done with the uh, Shinchiriyan University and uh, here in Adama? I actually, I mean, now in Adama Science and Technology University, in Ethiopia. So can is, is it possible, sir? Of course, and if you want to just drop me an email, we can we can continue the conversation um, about such collaborations. We've had some touch points also with um, NWU, um, Northwestern University in South Africa. So um, they have a few different campuses and have uh, some some interest in in the work that we're doing as well. But at this moment, we haven't codified any collaborations. So. Um, we're just in discussion, and, but it's really important for us. One of the things that, because I continue my affiliation at Stanford, we're really interested in these public-private partnerships. And, and also because we're an EU entity, uh, because we're a Dutch holding company for Regen Villages, we also look at this idea of bringing in EU funding uh, on, on relevant projects, whether it's South Africa or India or other places. Um, yeah. Because the EU does take interest in this. Sure, I think that'll be great. Oh, okay, yes, so thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, thank Dr. You. Mishra, for your question. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Look forward to being touched. Namaste. Sir. So, can I, on one question, please. So, um, can you send this uh, video, the recording, to us? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I'm like this video will be posted on Adora's YouTube channel, and you'll be sharing it with all the participants. So it will be better so that uh, I can show here to the students as well as my PhD students are here. Actually, I'm guiding also supervising PhD students. So basically, I'm yes. uh, in the signal and image processing area so that it was very interesting for me. So I want to uh, hybridize the mode of uh, green engineering and image processing, so both of them. And with actually, I'm doing on AI also. So in uh, India and Africa, like this with you, so a big collaboration with different professors, and I want to make a different platform so that uh, in future it will be very good for me. That I'm saying. So yeah, thank I, you, it's, it's thank great. You. I love it, and and signal processing and sensors uh, are part and parcel to to everything that we're we're talking about here. Sensors, you know, are also becoming more ubiquitous, and and the prices are coming down, and we're seeing all kinds of self-powered sensors now. And, and even, um, you know, uh, organic biological sensors. This starts getting back into the whole mycelial network topic, which is really interesting, um, you know, these sort of mem resistors and such. So um, let me see, other questions here. Uh, so uh, James, there's a question from the CEO of uh, Parvel University, Mr. Nero. He says, please give me some examples of how mechanical engineering can use AIML in different areas of mechanical engineering. So the question is about mechanical engineering informing yes. AI? Yes, uh, how, uh, he's asking how the mechanical engineering can use AIML in different areas uh, of mechanical engineering. That's what he's asking. He was looking for some examples. Well, you know, what we do essentially is to take generic values from systems. So you design a system, so there's a mechanical engineering process, right? Whatever that system is. Um, and that system has a certain functionality, right? It has expected 
performance, it has ranges, it has properties, um, and, and that can be distilled into data that can then be synthetically adopted into machine learning algorithms and models, right? And then, well, there's that system and it exists in the form as a digital twin. It's not a physical thing anymore. It's now a virtual thing. Um, so that's what we really, the kernel of our work is based on that really. And then, okay, so then you can say, okay, what, what if we take this machine and we do X, Y, and Z with it in different scenarios? Well, then you're creating simulations from that synthetic data. So that is in a sense what we would do, we are doing with um, mechanical engineering data, with regenerative infrastructure engineering data, with architectural data that is, um, you know, typology data and, and also the land values, what the land is capable of. We, f we start first and foremost with the land is capable of, but the question really is in particular about machine learning. So I think that's really the answer is just that it is, it's an opportunity to, um, to build models based on previous work that's been studied and done. All right. Thank you, James. Thanks for your answer. I think Dr. Nidra, you got the answer that you were looking for. Thank you, Hair. So, um, yeah. I'm just looking uh, for other questions. Um, yeah, I think it's we have a Dr. Sizimra. I'm sorry. Uh, in Mark, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> Sorry if I'm taking yes, your name wrong. It's him, no issue, man. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining. Uh, did, you can ask a question, please. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, it's afternoon here. I am from India. Uh, my name is Dr. Ivan. I am a PhD in statistics, and I'm currently working as a scientist at National Institute of Occupational Health, ICMR. So, sir, my basic question is like here in um, in an issue like ours, we are basically concerned about workplace safety and health. And recently it has been seen that AI ML models have been deployed to just ensure, to make precise models for ensuring workplace safety and health. But recently I did submit a project, uh, a, a, an intramural project, wherein I would be using uh, ML models for, uh, for the prediction of heat stress. In, in workers who are exposed to heat. But uh, I, I have one thing in mind, how do I determine the sample size? What, what should be the sample size, efficient sample size for machine learning models? Because I saw there is no such, uh, like uh, there is a rule of thumb that uh, the sample size needs to be 10 times the number of features you are going to record. But then in a survey-based study, to what extent we can uh, like, choose the sample size for an efficient machine learning model with the predetermined equities? Um, you know, honestly, the best uh, thing to do is to try to get as much sample size as you possibly can. Yes, sir. And, and that, that's because we don't have to, we can't worry anymore about the complexity. Yes, sir. Right? It's, it's but you do need the, the bulk <laughs> of it. Yes, to be able to 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 distill it Just down to something. The yes, exactly. exactly, exactly. So I would say that the more the better, um, and that's what's so exciting about about a village or a neighborhood. You can imagine how much information is coming from food, water, energy, waste to resource management, residences, mobility. There's so much going on, and and, and, and not only that, but how do you not only just ingest it and parse it and analyze it and simulate it and, and understand it, but also what can you then do with it? And that's also a design challenge we have going forward, which is going back to the mechanical engineering question from before, 
is that we need to see a whole new generation of systems. And I think this could be an exciting thing for, for a lot of the engineering professors and, and, and students on the call about systems that are open, uh, open API, but have the capability where, where like the, for instance, the Village OS software could reach out to that system, that engineering system and actuate an intervention, right? So whether it's a water system, a waste system, a food system, whatever it is, um, because that's also a challenge for us. There's also there's always this opportunity to say, okay, we have information about something. The question is, what can you do with it? And we need to be able to create these robotic autonomous interventions so that um, that these systems can can be. Um, self-reliant themselves self-reliant but I know that's not germane to your question but I think the bigger data set the yes. better you'll be yes, sir. Thank you, sir. thanks for the question thank you, sir. thanks Dr. Shah thank you. Uh, James you can pick from the Q&A question um, I've got I got a peace researcher I've got uh, Dr. Um, Yadav um, or Yadav uh, how do you see AI could be the biggest challenge? Yeah, it, it, yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you see AI could be biggest challenges to peace and sustainability? Um, you know, I've, I've moved my, myself around Stanford in a few different interesting groups and, and have some really lovely colleagues that I sort of connected with over the years. One has been what's called the peace innovation lab. And, and, um, and that was a group that we used to like, I would, it was interesting because I would travel around the world and I would do these presentations and lectures and, 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 and be looking at the different opportunities for developing different communities, et cetera. And I would keep running into these people, uh, you know, wherever I was around the world. And we would then join together in our meetings and our collaborations and such. Um, and, and, and again, here we are with a, with, a, with a major war that broke out in Europe. We have a major war going on right now between um, you know, a nuclear power, Russia and, and Ukraine. And um, it's not subsiding. It's, it's, um, it's, um, it's getting worse. You know, it's, it's, it, every day it's getting more uh, pronounced. And, um, and what can AI do for this? What can machine learning do for this? It, unfortunately, I feel like these, a lot of these systems are being used now to make weapon systems better, more efficient. Um, and I call it the population reduction industry. You know what I mean? And so uh, that's, a, that's a challenge. We're coming now from the Center for Compassion, Altruism, Research and Education, CCARE at Stanford with, with you know, a concept of mindfulness and a concept of of being able to be uh, capable of having empathy for others. And, and for some reason, that's a struggle, you know, for, in many ways around the world to get funding for, for things to be supported. Um, and because it, it's, it's not that it's squishy science, because it's not, it's backed by functional MRI and it shows that it improves health and, and uh, you know, can improve, um, you know, not only longevity, but, but um, you know, reduce, you know, dementia and other kinds of things. These are all really key markers, right? But the problem is getting the, the industry and the investors and the folks who, who are, or in philanthropists, whatever, to support such things. So I would say that um, we're trying hard to have AI and machine learning inform what it can, how it can to make the world a better, more flourishing place. And we think the end result of that, in other words, if you create communities that are self-reliant and people are feeling compassionate, you're already brokering peaceful, happy places. And if you build enough of them, these sort of lily pads of peaceful, happy places, the thought is, the hope is that we'll have peaceful world, um, which has always been 
I think a lot of nice people like who are on this call, we all want that. I don't think any of us understand why there's conflict, you know? So anyway, I don't know exactly how specifically other than the ways I just mentioned that AI uh, and machine learning will be able to inform and, 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 and come overcome some of these things. Um, you think for yourself, like what could happen between India and Pakistan, you know, India and China. Uh, there's flashpoints right now, right? At the borders. Always. And always, but you know, the one with China has also been heating up a bit over the last number of years. So, you know, what do we do? How do we fix that? Um, and anyway, so next question. Uh, Let's see. Can this model also consider natural disasters? Yes. It's an important, important question. And the answer is yes. It, um, it needs to be able to understand what we look at, for instance, is not only what the land wants, but what is the area that this land is based in, right? So the geospatial data also would tell us and inform us on, oh, this is a hurricane prone area or a typhoon prone area or a flood zone, or it is seismically active. Um, you know, uh, there's also a lot of things that we're working on now in terms of pollution and, and community retrofits in, in highly polluted areas. How do you, what can be done to, you know, to, to uh, remediate those places? So uh, let's see, the robots can change the culture, emotional appeal of agriculture. Um, Okay, in veterinary science, a veterinary science. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm animal husbandry is not my strength. Um, I have to be perfectly honest with that. Uh, it is something important for regen villages, but I think that um, we're beginning to understand more and more that the the consciousness of animals, and um, and that we we can try to, to, to see what's possible with, with how these systems can relate better to, um, to this. Uh, I admit that I am an omnivore, so I do eat these animals. So I don't know how compassionate I am at the end of the day um, about that. So, but there are people obviously who are vegan, vegetarian, whatever. Um, and in these kinds of communities, it's a very thankful diet, by the way, to, to um, to eat less of animal protein. Uh, can AI be cost effective in the future? Uh, I believe yes. I believe it's what's happening now. It's 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 like anything else. I think what AI is going to do really well, going back to mechanical engineering, is that it can start to invent better battery systems. For instance, you know, like solid state super capacitor lossless, inexpensive batteries. And that's gonna be game changing. The moment we have, you know, home-based neighborhood scale storage, energy storage that is solid state and has a very long mean time before failure and it's really cheap kilowatt per hour, that's gonna change the nature of energy generation, distribution, storage, usage uh, across, across everything. So, um, uh, I yeah, see a see. very good question by Dr. Ati Priye from uh, Arti Arya from the University, which is, are there any policies or regulations in progress to regulate the improper use of AI? I'm like, are we looking at some guidelines? on AI because people are talking about it being unethical. People are even worried about it be, uh, turning dominant. You understand that? So, well, so, so here's, here's a couple of things. You know, one, there's been a call to, to pause, globally pause hmm. um, AI machine learning development for six months yeah. until we can catch up yes. with a some- A lot of eminent people did that. Like, so yes. Some very yes. about that. Like, like Elon Musk, for instance. Yes, right? Elon Musk. But 
the problem is that's that that you know that ship has sailed. You know that train has left the station. However you want to look at it, um, there's no way back anymore um, because there are actors, states. You know whether it's India, whether it's China. I mean, you know, people are driven to compete, to to win, and to to be at the forefront. And um, and there's a lot of brilliant people in India and a lot of brilliant people in China, and they're not going to stop. You know, because Elon Musk or anybody says, mm, let's hold up until we have these rules in place. Um, there is an interesting and I have to, you know, you know, kind of look up exactly what happened. But there was there were there were a team of researchers who who um, created an, a, an AI intelligence. And um, and it was communicating with itself and and rewriting its code and and it had generated its own language that the researchers could not understand and it was and it was and the, and the system was specifically keeping this language cryptic from the researchers because it didn't want to know what it was talking about they pulled the plug <laughs> on this thing because it was scary as hell you know, this we don't scary. know. It's this scary, scary, right? Really? So damn scary, I guess. So you know, I mean, when I was growing up, I saw this movie called War Games. You know, which was with Matthew Broderick, and it's this lovely movie from the I don't know early '80s or something. And you know, basically, like he he taps into to play a video game. You know, which was a dial-up. You know, like modem back then. He found a way to hack into this video game. And it turned out he hacked into the system that was like NORAD. And it was this AI computer that was capable of running real time, you know, nuclear simulations, you know, nuclear threat simulations. In any case, the kid almost caused World War III from, from playing a game. Um, so yes, I don't disagree. There needs to be boundaries. There needs to be, the EU right now is trying to you know, to create, you know, mostly it's around copyright, I think, and around privacy. I think those are those are the, you know, and those are of course very important topics and big topics, but um, it's also really getting a lot of pushback because because it's going to essentially keep the EU from being able to compete with China and India and the U.S. So. I don't know if this is, we're in really an uncharted territory right now. Um, you know, is, is the, someone has a concern that is AI a solution for every problem? No, and it's not. Um, we just think that it can be helpful in, in learning new things. And it's hard for us because, you know, we're a company and we're raising money right, for our, our, our company and our software development of things that we're doing. And it's hard to explain to investors the excitement of the things we don't yet know, right? Because of the things we need to learn, things we need to explore. But that's the excitement of being an academic. You know, that's the excitement of, I think most everybody is on this call probably. So I, um, you know, we do what we do. Um, what, will the, the, what will be the extent of impact of AI and ML on human relationships in the future. Uh, you know, I'm seeing some of these robots coming out and they look pretty human, pretty realistic. That's starting to get scary too. Um, and interesting. I mean, there will be people who will marry a robot, you know, have a robot as a spouse. And, um, it's just going to, it's going to happen. I mean, there are, are people in Japan who have these already these sort of synthetic dolls or whatever yep. that they're engaged to or married to. I don't know. People um, are anyways already in love with Siri. So <laughs> a lot of them are really going to fall in love for the real Siri. Uh, yeah, and 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 um, it's been a fantasy in science fiction now for ages. You know, going back you know, before like Blade Runner and all these different things that there, there could be some kind of, um, then there was a, there was a movie, um, 
forget the name of the movie. I think it was called Her, where oh, where this, yeah, where where um, uh, Joaquin Phoenix is like falls in love with a synthetic, you know, bot, and is just can't you know he just can't get this this synthetic woman out of his head. Anyway, I don't know. Again, it's um, the well, hope is with, with some Hollywood fantasy, and it comes to life. I mean, all the researchers and everybody around the world put their heads into it to make it a reality. And that, that's what's hap happening, actually. I mean, like, you know, think about this. People thinking about actually falling in love. Maybe there could be a Tinder or a dating app for falling in love with robots. <laughs> well, well, I think it's, I think it's, you know, it it's, can be very charming and, and, and lovely, and especially for, for, for elderly or yes. lonely. There's lots of, there are lots of great opportunities. Yes, but I I do worry that that um, it's another breaking point to disassociate ourselves mm -hmm. from from nature, yeah. and I see more of these immersive headsets now coming out, you know, as well. And even if it's augmented reality, like Apple's new headset is, I I it does concern me because I feel like we're we're further and further down a path where. People don't even know, you know, where their food comes from. They just assume it's the supermarket, and that's it, or or a fast food restaurant or a restaurant, whatever. Um, so uh, let's see, a couple more questions here. The role of AI in aiding humanity, no doubt, cannot be ignored. Uh, engineering should be accompanied by legal codes. Absolutely, um, it's something that I, I didn't mention in in the talk because for whatever reason, this I didn't have that slide, but. One of the things that we're doing is using the Village OS to ingest rule books. I think that's a really exciting place. Talk about you know huge data sets, right? Local, regional, national, you know, or state, federal, whatever you want to call it, rule books. Now these rules for let's say residential planning, for instance, are not black box. They exist. The problem is they exist in many places and in different file formats. And typically you have to hire these very expensive consultants to in any case, interpret these rules. So we like to imagine aggregating those rule books and then letting machine learning crawl all that data and start to suggest a, a better rule or rules for that, that relate to um, regenerative resiliency. And we think then all of a sudden government can say, oh, well, the work has been done and it's trusted and we understand it. And, and yes, this, this kind of development does make sense because we can actually see the long-term positive externalities from the output of this. So it's a great question. Um, I'm just seeing idea of developing, improving upon good human qualities, uh, seemingly the little changes such as occur in your future. Um, so changing human behavior is that what the question is? Our biggest job would be trying to get the best neighbors we can be. Um, yeah, uh, I feel personally that when, when you build a community like a region villages, it's gonna overproduce abundant surplus of good things, clean water, renewable energy, you know, delicious food. That invites a, a what I call public goodwill radius around those communities. A typical eco village can have somewhere like 25 or 30 kilometer goodwill radius because of the fact that there's local community members coming from all different places. There's more like campus-like environments. There's cultural events. There's, there's culinary events. There's all different kinds of things. And so that really engages people uh, and, and makes people feel more neighborly. That's at least the hope. Um, a, expect, expecting to grow and support business, placing people, I expect people to understand AI when 99% will struggle to, to make their ends. Well, that's, that's the, you know, that question right there, it's the anonymous attendee um, who's frightened uh, that 99% of people are gonna struggle to make ends meet. How many people do we know around the world right now are struggling to make ends meet? I mean, <laughs> you know, honestly, it's a struggle. There's, there's a very few percent of people who are, are kind of doing okay, right? And there's a whole swath 
of planet Earth that's not. That's just, it's just unequitable across the board. It's just like, it has to be fixed. So we really feel like that's what this whole mission is about. It's about building these kinds of communities that are capable of allowing people to, to, to provide for themselves and their families. And then, you know, you don't even know about AI or ML. You don't know about it. You don't have to know about it. You just know that you have the ability to, to live in, in a peaceful place and, and take care of your needs and your family's needs. So these are all really good goals, I think, and objectives for machine learning to focus on. Um, so we're about time and uh, sure before we wrap up uh, i mean there's one more question that we would like to ask you and probably get your a lot of questions yes sorry just... i didn't get to all of them uh, did we address most of them i think you know we did did you do you want to take any question before this i'm okay i i you know it's just there's a lot to look at so i know it's getting late or in the day for you and then you know for me too at some point i have to go to sleep so um, if you have, you want to ask me a final question, that's yes. fine. And so, well, we all we so this masterclass has been organized by Adora, and Adora is essentially in doing short-term international education, wherein we are helping university students move around the world. We call it the academic freedom for students, where they can now pick courses and meet solvers and professors and lecturers and amazing researchers like you in the domain and learn from them. Now, we also understand there's a plethora of, you know, online courses that are available. So, and a lot of people are actually taking up this course as well, and which is, which some of them really good. And that really helps you to absorb a lot of material content as well. But do you still think, because we are talking about, you know, region villages, and we're talking about people actually going back and understanding the circularity of nature and stuff like that. Do you think that on-campus jump of an international location or like people from, U.S. going to other locations, from India going to other universities. So, do you think international boot camps, even short term, are they really a life changing experience for a student? Yeah, I, I think that any opportunity to to be present, right, and to accept information and to grow is is amazing. And, and, and it's a celebration of life, like eating something delicious, right? You, you take it in and, and it creates a visceral experience. Um, this very wonderful human being named Paul Stamets, who, who is a, um, essentially a professor of um, mycorrhizal mycelial networks and fungal networks, um, you know, he's off to talk about how when he gives a lecture or a talk, how he's inoculating people, you know, with with these ideas, and and that they've sort of become. It's not maybe a great definition, but a, sort of a spore, if you will, and they can take that with them, and they can then um, inoculate others, and and I think if we do that in the right way, with the right kind of information, that it's really pivotal. And, and I've seen all different kinds of programs. I've seen sort of executive programs, I've seen boot camps, I've seen startup labs. They're all, they all have relevance. They're all very interesting. Um, I am a big proponent of prototyping. I'm a big proponent of, of, of learning in groups and collaborating. I think it's really important that people are are getting that validation and also that they're capable of having design, what's called design empathy, which is really what I, what I have that I've brought and learned from Stanford and my work um, with Professor Larry Leifer is at the Center for Design Research, which studies where ideas come from. And, and it's really, really interesting work about how we are there and present for each other that allows ideas to be born. And, um, and it's very simple things with how we speak to each other, with respect, with empathy, with kindness, how we, how we relate and, and being able to dampen our egos and, and design and 
um, and learn and grow. So yeah, I think it's it's important stuff. I see a question here I have to answer because it's really important. Can we teach robots to love humans? I love that question. And the answer is we are the robot's parents. What kind of parenting shall we teach our kids? The hope is to be really good citizens and wonderful people and caring and, and full of love and, 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 and understanding and empathy. So yeah, I do believe that we can teach robots not only to love humans, but to love nature and to love preserving nature, um, which doesn't necessarily, hopefully doesn't mean removing us because we don't always preserve nature. So those are those, you know, those, uh, um, those kinds of decision trees that we have to be careful about. But yeah, I think it's a great question. And perhaps we end on that note um, that we can teach computers. Just that. I mean, there, are, there are multiple researchers and multiple researchers already going on, which are actually trying to prove that AI is not emotionless. People think that AI would not have a heart. They would not have emotions. But we, can, we are actually building a very strong neural network, a neural framework for AI, which will also have these kinds of emotions. And, and this is only going to get better. So trust me, when you say that you have those AI robots who are gonna love you, trust me, their love is gonna be really authentic. If you really, and you can really manipulate that entire feeling with, with those AI robots and everything. So yes, I mean, like there's a lot of future we, we would love to you probably live with the virtual and the real in the future ahead. And that's the reality. And reality. like you said, we are parents, we can make it better. Yep. Well, this has been great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm in deep gratitude for, for this opportunity to, to speak to so many people. There was a lot of people here who, who came on and there's so many bright people and so many great questions, so many doctors and professors and and, uh, and university folks and academics and, and others. So we're, we're really, really um, looking forward to seeing how we can take this and move forward together in collaboration. So yes, if there are places in India that would be interesting, if there are partners that would be in, of interest, um, we would love to be able to explore how we could could really have this take root uh, in India. So thanks for that. Wonderful. So it has been, I mean, like we are really blessed and honored to have you. It was really a very enlightening session. I'm sure a lot of attendees would agree to that. Uh, we still have many questions and everything else, but we are limited with time. Thank you so much, everyone, for being such a lovely audience uh, and for blessing uh, the first session of Adora's Masterclass. We really look forward to amazing sessions like these in the near future and we'll keep you updated. Thank you so much here. Thank you so much, James. And thanks everyone for being a part of it. Always master. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you. Thank you everyone. Thanks James. Cheers. Thank you.